Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, and for those who are returning from last year, we decided to start on time this year instead of an hour late, so thank you. Um, I'm Andy Kitzrow, I am the city administrator, and I have the privilege of being the MC for this evening. Um, before we get started, I do want to um, highlight a few people here in the room this evening. Um, we do have our uh, elected officials from the city council. Um, we have uh, council vice president, Angela Blake. Ooh, ooh. Uh, council member, Michelle Gregory. Council member Deshaun Dowdery, Dowdy, right there. Um, also from the county council, council president John Cannon. And I don't think I've missed anybody else, but we may have. Oh, Sharon DeShield. Uh, I apologize. Newly elected council member Sharon DeShields. Looking forward to the swearing in on uh, Monday evening. Um, so, uh, again, thank you for everybody coming out to the State of the City. Um, we're really excited to have this um, this evening. Um, looking forward to the remarks from Mayor Heath and the rest of our department heads. Um, but before we get started on all of those, I would like to bring to the stage our po poet laureate, Nancy Mitchell. Thank you. Hello, everyone. As usual, this is just such an honor to be here with all of you. And um, this is a very kind of, uh, well, I'll just say it. It's an emotional state of the city poem written for 2023. Um, because our mayor, uh, Jack Heath, is leaving, it caused me to sort of muse and reminisce on the time that I have my tenure as Poet Laureate because Jack appointed me in the stead of Jack, of Jake, who had to be away. And when he gave me the appointment, he said, now listen, I'm an engineer. I don't know anything about poetry. <laughs> but he was such a good sport when I prevailed upon him to write a poem for my Poets on the Plaza reading series. He said, I'll do it, but don't bug me about it. And so I left him alone, and he came through the wonderful poem that's going to be in an anthology that's going to be coming out this December. And I've noticed during his subsequent speeches, he's become a lot more eloquent, so I'm looking for, forward to seeing his memoir. So, <laughs> so I'm just, it just caused me to, you know, have a little stroll down uh, memory lane and think of of all the joyous occasions I've been able to, I've been asked to write a poem. I was appointed Poet Laureate during probably the most exciting time in the history of our city. As it underwent a radical transformation inspired by the principles and vision of the Renaissance, which sought to yoke beauty, utility, and history. Many times in the process, of our downtown was a construction site, you might remember. Yet the dust and noise of industry thrilled this granddaughter of a civil engineer who designed and built bridges spanning from North New York to the coast of North Carolina, and the daughter of an engineer and wildcatter who detonated mines from World War II in the Sahara de Desert to prepare it for drilling. I wrote more than two, 20 poems commemorating every manifestation of this vision from two swearing-ins, four State of the City addresses, murals hoping for reparation, folk festivals, ribbing cuttings for the new downtown, and roundabout, to name a few. And I can say it's been the greatest joy and honor of my career, and it's been a blast. And I'm hoping maybe this is not the last poem <laughs> I'll be writing for the city, but we'll see. And during my tenure, I got to know the leaders and employees and citizens of this great city, and I fell in love with every one of you in this room. The state of the city at this moment is on the precipice of a change of leadership, which portends to be a radical change of direction. 
Yet this is not the first storm our city has faced. Just as Jake Day knew he could leave the city in the capable hands of Jack Heath and his stalwart city crew, Mayor Heath knows the city council can handle this. No matter who becomes mayor, they will have to win the confidence and contend with a bright, feisty, and diverse council. In the ancient Chinese book of changes, the I Ching, there is a line that says, the town may be changed, but the well cannot be changed. Meaning that deep source from which we draw our nourishment and tradition will remain the same. And I believe that source is grounded in basic kindness and a love for our city and all its citizens. Some worry that the progress we've made in healing the heart of our downtown is a gathering place to celebrate auspicious occasions, such as the unveiling today of the Harry Tubman statue, may be arrested or cease. But anyone who has a rudimentary knowledge of physics knows that that train has left the station and there's no stopping progress now. If anyone asked me what I hope for our next mayor, I would have to say that they have the vision for our city that it can be the best it can be without sacrificing beauty, art, and history. And that they will possess the qualities of our mayor, Jack Heath, who leads with civility and grace. And that they pass the test of a first-rate intelligence, such as our mayor possesses, of the capability to hold in the mind two opposing views and retain the ability to still function. And in decisions, they be as deliberate and wise and equitable as King Solomon. Yes, the days ahead will be challenging and tempest-tossed, but I'm confident that we'll, we're in good hands with our city crew and our city will not founder on the rocks of adversity. And besides, I know our new mayor, just as I did, will fall in love with every single one of you. Thank you. Again, thank you, Nancy, for your artistic words of encouragement and wisdom. Um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, also thank Salisbury University for hosting us. We have Dr. Lynn LaPree, Chief of Staff, Eli Modlin in the back. So thank you all for hosting us. I don't have many words to say, and I know Jack wants to give the introduction, so I will leave it at that and let Mayor Heath come to the stage for opening remarks. I'm looking forward to it. This is uh, going to be a little different, so be patient with me. Good evening, and thank you for coming to tonight's 2023 State of the City Address. There have been many changes in the past year, and to say that it was interesting would be an understatement. Here are some of the changes from the past year that have shaped us into who we are today. Within the first four months, our former mayor, Jake Day, was appointed by Governor Moore as the new Secretary of Housing and Community Development. Julia Glanz and media specialist Allison Foster both joined Jake Secretary Day's team. A short time later, Communications Director Casey Martin to decide, decided to explore new horizons as she embarks on a promising career transition. I extend my best wishes to them. Today I am pleased to say that we have found outstanding individuals to fill those roles. I appointed Andy Kittro, assistant, uh, who was assistant city uh, administrator to the city administrator's position. I brought in retired assistant city administrator Tom Stevenson to serve his deputy city administrator position until we recently appointed former fire chief John Tull as the new deputy city administrator. In June, 
We bid farewell to our police chief, Barbara Duncan, who retired. And after a national search, we appointed Colonel Dave Meinshine. Furthermore, the city happily welcomes Sean Yonker and Jordan Ray as the new media comms team. In light of these changes and occasional instances of having over 20 job vacancies, the city continued to deliver essential, essential services to our citizens. We've accomplished remarkable feats and exceeded our goals through steadfast dedication while recognizing the invaluable support we've received. To drive our progress, we secured a substantial $26 million in grants, funding pivotal structures like finance um, of our city projects. As the acting mayor, I outlined several key objectives and pro projects for the city, each contributing to our vision a thriving community, and those included new project management goals and procedures, strengthening lines of communication, community relations, continue to work closely with Salisbury University, the Greater Salisbury Committee, and this Salisbury Chamber of Commerce. Also, our Vision Zero plan of no fatalities. Creating new networking opportunities. Increase affordable housing with continuation of our Here is Home program. And re reduction of homeless through the Ann Street Village transitioning, transitional housing. Together we have made great progress towards these goals while understanding that these are ongoing efforts. However, our commitment to progress remains unwavering. Reflecting on some accomplishments, I remember the words of my first boss and mentor, advice that I've carried with me ever since. He said, to be an effective leader and achieve your goals, you must surround yourself with the best people provide the resources they need, and then get out of the way. This statement resonates deeply with the heart of our city's success. These goals are not easy, and no one person can achieve them alone. It's about building a team of experts and empowering them to excel. I'm proud to say that we have the best team that one could put together right here in Salisbury. Each one of our department heads embodies the spirit of this advice. They are the subject experts, the individuals who, who work tirelessly to turn our shared vision into reality. This was a little controversial, the next line. when I, you're, It's a little different than it's been in the past. Who better to report on the department's highlights from the past year than our esteemed department heads? So please, join me in welcoming our department heads and Andy Kittrow, our city administrator, as he will guide us through the remainder of the program. Best of luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Heath, for those opening remarks. Um, please welcome to the stage our city clerk, Kim Nichols. Good evening. I'm Kim. Um, Assistant City Clerk Julie English is here, and together she and I make up the entire clerk team. 
Um, our office provides support to the City Council and we've prepared the agenda for attended and recorded minutes for 67 council meetings, work sessions, budget sessions, and closed sessions so far this year. Um, City Hall offices moved to our new location at the SBY headquarters building in May, and we held our first council meeting in August in the building. Um, and with Julie over a year ago, she began the long, difficult process of evaluating and recreating the entire city's record retention schedule. Um, this had not been done for 15 years since it was created initially. So she submitted the new schedules for all 13 departments to Maryland State Archives in September, worked very hard on that, um, and we're eagerly awaiting their approval for that. Um, this year also she attended 25 educational classes, seminars, workshops, conferences, both in person and virtually, um, to earn points towards the prestigious Certified Municipal Clerk designation. Um, this course of study through Virginia Commonwealth University takes about three years to complete and she's worked very hard and I think she's almost there. So proud of her for that. Um, we'll find out very soon, I think. Um, the clerk's office administers the elections uh, for the mayor and council every four years. We geared into election mode in January with monthly planning meetings um, with the Wacomico County Board of Elections and our Salisbury Election Board. Uh, we prepared hard and, and we got through last week's election. Um, we had our first filing in February of this year and um, we've tackled uh, a lot of uh, unprecedented events along the way with this election. Um, we congratulate everyone um, in that and then we just want to invite everyone to the swearing in ceremony on Monday, November 20th. Um, at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate those words. And congratulations on successfully navigating the election. Uh, next to the stage, we have our director of waterworks, Corey Cameron. She is so excited to share her remarks. <laughs> Director of the Department of Waterworks. Waterworks has 75 employees throughout the three divisions, water plant, wastewater plant, and the water and, city, water and sewer utilities division. We pump on average six to six and a half million gallons per day from each plant. Our staff works 24 seven. Our treatment plants are staffed around the clock. And, and although our maintenance and utility crews are basically day shift, they're the ones who are out here at night fixing the water mains service line breaks, sewer stoppages, hydrants that are hit, et cetera. Our water and sewer operators must be certified through the Maryland Department of the Environment. We carry certifications in Maryland Water 4, Wastewater 5A, Distribution 1, Collections 2, Sludge, and Superintendents across all categories. Our operators are put through a rigorous training program of on-the-job training and Maryland EARN. Maryland EARN is a grant-funded training program by the Maryland Center for Environmental Training. And the grant provides online training for our operators, for all operators statewide. At the, end of the op at the end of the course, the operators take the Maryland State Certification Exam. In 2023, we had six operators across our three divisions pass their state certification exam upon completion of the program. So our drinking water continues to win awards as the best tasting water in Maryland through Maryland Rural Water Association and the best tasting groundwater system through the Chesapeake section of the American Water Works Association. In 2024, our drinking water will compete at the National Rural Water Conference in Washington, D.C. in February and the AWWA, American Water Works Association annual conference 
in Anaheim, California in June. Besides our day-to-day -day operations, this past year we have completed our annual hydrant flushing program, performed our quarterly pump station cleaning and maintenance, renewed our water and wastewater permits through MDE, Maryland Department of Environment, updated our water conservation plan, completed and submitted our annual water audit and water loss reduction plan, mailed out our annual water quality consumer confidence report to all city residents, submitted our cybersecurity plan to the Maryland Gen General Assembly through the Modernized Maryland Act, completed design of a solar field at the wastewater treatment plant and will begin construction in 2024, received a Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund Operation and Maintenance Grant of $442,000 for optimum wastewater treatment plant performance in reducing nitrogen and phosphorus levels. And these funds we take and put back into the plant for ongoing maintenance. Um, so, yes. we, can, we continue to compete annually in the Weiland Foundation's Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. In 2023, the city of Salisbury placed 25th out of cities across the nation with populations of 30 to 99,000. You can sign up to take the Water Conservation Pledge on our webpage. Salisbury.md, go to Waterworks, there's a sign up place, or you'll see us out at local events and we always have the sign up plans um, forms. So if you can serve water, you save money on your water bill. Um, in collaboration with Wicomico County, we have extended water service to the Salisbury Airport. We've established a new water and sewer extension policy, and we are updating our biosolids and leachate agreement. We have partnered with the Maryland Department of Labor and Wicomico County Schools to offer an apprenticeship program for water and wastewater operators to all VOTEC students. We have also partnered with Maryland Rural Water Association for an adult apprenticeship program for water operator training, which was just approved this past Tuesday by the Mar Maryland Labor Apprenticeship Training Council. So what's next for us? Paleo Well 3 should be in service by the spring of 2024. This will be the city's largest water well with the ability to produce 4,500 gallons per minute. Waterworks has partnered with 120 Water to help us complete a lead service line inventory that is due to Maryland Department of Environment and the EPA by October of 2024. We are currently cross-referencing our tax database to identify any homes that were built prior to 1988. If you're on that list and we've not already sampled your home, you'll be receiving a postcard in the mail in the, over the next several months. We offer a free lab test to check your home for lead. If your house was built before 1988, we want to sample your water for free. Um, if you don't know if your plumbing's been replaced, then contact us. We will deliver six sample bottles to your house, drop them on your front porch, you let your water sit stagnant overnight for six hours, fill the bottles, sign them, date them, put them back on the front porch, we will come pick them up and ship them out to a lab for you. We will send you the results, and if it pops up that you have lead, then we will contact you and help you to move forward with that. In addition, we are diligently reviewing records and files and we'll do some sample digs around the city to identify and replace any stray lead pipes that may be still out in the system. We do apply a corrosion inhibitor into our system which keeps any lead from leaching out of the pipes. But if water sits stagnant in your home overnight and you have lead pipes, you could potentially pull lead from your pipes. So let's work together and fix that. In conclusion, I would just like to say that our employees are the unsung heroes. It takes a per special person to climb in a sewer, go below the surface to repair a lift station pump, stand in water in the freezing cold to repair a water main and restore water service, work the night shift to keep the water and wastewater flowing, on and on. But those of us that work in this department are dedicated water and sewer public health professionals, and we are here to serve the public every day. We are here 24 to 7, 24-7, delivering clean water to your homes. Water is life and water is essential. Thank you.
See, that was easy. <clears throat> I just want to echo Corey's points about um, unsung heroes. We often um, forget when we turn on the tap or flush the toilet how easy that process is, and that all happens because of the great work by her team. So I do congratulate you. If that stopped happening, we would definitely know. So um, thank you again. Um, next up, our Director of Procurement, Jennifer Miller. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd just like to point out that that truck is not an official City of Salisbury truck, and we know that because it's not properly branded. Right. Well, good evening. My name's Jennifer Miller, and as Andy said, I'm the Director of Procurement of a small staff of four, but mighty department for the City of Salisbury. And after serving in this role for 10 years, I can tell you it's far more than just purchasing or buying stuff. Proactive needs assessment, sourcing expertise, negotiation strategy, managing vendor relationships, and risk mitigation are just a few of our daily activities. This evening, I'd like to highlight several accomplishments of the procurement department of the last year. Thank you. First, let's dive into some of our KPIs, or key performance indicators, which help us gauge productivity and efficiency. In the last fiscal year, we issued hundreds of purchase orders and saved the city over $1.7 million in additional costs. In 2022, City Council approved increasing the maximum dollar amount for direct purchases and we launched the city's first purchase card program to provide a streamlined and efficient method of purchasing minor supplies and services. Last year alone, 1,500 purchase card transactions were made, resulting in increased procurement efficiency in a market of rapidly rising costs. We continue to expand our reach into new markets and new sources of supply. Each year, we manage approximately 100 ongoing contracts, and in this past year alone, we awarded 25 new contracts and onboarded 22 new vendors from our own backyard here in Salisbury to sunny San Diego, California. We're fortunate to have a robust pool of local resources, and over 20% of the city's expenditures for goods and services stayed local. And in the ongoing effort to drive costs down and practice sustainable procurement, we made two seemingly small but important steps toward additional cost avoidance by electronic transmission of purchase orders and migrating many vendors to e-billing. Lastly, I'd like to highlight the professional development accomplishments of the procurement team, a team that I'm so very proud of. Combined, we have over 450 hours of industry-specific training in a very specialized body of knowledge. And staff holds key industry certifications, such as Certified Public Procurement Officer, Certified Public Procurement Buyer, and NIGP Public Procurement Associate, demonstrating achievement of a high standard of competency in public procurement and remaining up to date on the latest procurement practices and procedures. Public procurement, therefore, is a critical part of the city's strategy. In closing, I'd like to take a brief moment to recognize and thank a dedicated staff of the Department of Procurement and leave you with a quote by William Edwards Deming, a business theorist that we often reference in procurement. In God we trust, all others must bring data. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate those words. I know sometimes you as the gatekeeper of, of money becomes complicated, but the money that we save because of the efforts of your team um, is invaluable. So thank you once again. Next to the stage, I'd like to bring one of our newest directors, um, Muir Boda, Housing and Community Development. Muir.
Good evening. Uh, before I <clears throat> get started with my brief presentation, I would like to take a moment of personal privilege and uh, thank uh, Mayor Heath for your friendship, mentorship over the years and your leadership in this city. Uh, we, we are a much better city for your participation and leadership, so thank you. <clears throat> this is a much different view than one that I've had for the past eight years, uh, sir, having served on the city council, and uh, it is quickly becoming a very rewarding uh, job. And one of the first thing is uh, getting, getting in and building a team and uh, understanding <clears throat> the structure and how things work on this side of the aisle. Housing Community Development has three divisions. We have our Code Compliance Division, we have our Community Relations Division, and we have our Housing First Homeless Services Division. And uh, this year, uh, the uh, Homeless Services Division experienced some significant losses in personnel uh, in the middle of the summer, and we're down to, at one point when I got there, one person in the division. Uh, so, uh, but our, our other divisions, uh, code enforcement, we have a very strong team, a uh, very experienced team. Some people have only been there for a couple months, some people have been there for 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, and so one of the things I challenged that team when I came on was while you're in the community doing things and looking th at things a little bit different. So the initial challenge was let's start a property of the month. Find the best property in each of your quadrants and will uh, as a team vote on the property of the month and the winner gets to have lunch with me uh, and so uh, the, the first month which was September uh, we had a property of the month and Larry our code enforcement officer that has his quadrant he won and October we turned it around and said let's let's do something a little more fun and look at best Halloween uh, decorations and we had the community involved uh, and Larry again won for October so He's two for two. Um, and uh, so that's something a little bit different we did uh, with our team, and it's, uh, it's, done, it's been really positive, and, and they're excited about it. It, it brings some, some uh, better participation and involvement uh, from them. Next, uh, coming into our Housing First Division uh, with some of the, the changes, we were, we were searching for uh, someone who brought a lot of professional experience and education and so the individual that we hired as our, as our Housing First Homeless Services Manager is Latanya Christopher. Uh, Latanya's story is not just about someone who was in the social work uh, field. Latanya, at the age of 13, she, she was homeless. And through her life, she earned her, later in life, earned her high school diploma, uh, went to Warwick Community College, got an associate's degree in chemical dependency, graduated uh, Salisbury University, uh, with a bachelor's degree in social work and then went on to obtain a master's of science in administration and human services. Uh, plus she brings a world of experience in case management, having worked in drug court for many years. And so she, she is currently working on rebuilding the foundation of case management. And in that we uh, have hired two more people that will be starting in a couple of weeks uh, for case management so that we can first fill out Ann Street. Uh, we are moving residents in a couple at a time. We're not going to just dump people in there. We're making sure they fit in the mix with those that are there and providing those wraparound services uh, there at Ann Street. So our goal is by the end of the year to have uh, Ann Street full with 22 residents that we can serve. And we have hired, uh, coming on board, is two incredible people with a lot of experience in that field. Uh, so that is critical in building your team, finding the right people, people that can work together, and people that can properly manage uh, the cases and, and, their, and the residents there. Uh, next, uh, we will be talking about our community relations division, which is run by Rachel Manning. Rachel, she's fantastic at what she's do she does. She's very organized. Uh, and we have both community centers have ongoing construction projects and she's, she's managing that, our relationship with the Boys and Girls Club who work out of Truett Street. And in that, we hired Logan Dillon, uh, who we stole from the zoo, uh, to be our uh, community uh, program manager. And she, she works out of the uh, Newton Community Center. And she, she's doing a fantastic job ensuring our after-school programming is working, managing all the programs that are happening at Newton Street, which include uh, everything from 
uh, the, like I said, the after school program. We got uh, community dinners in partnership with the Maryland Food Bank on a regular basis. And coming uh, there on the third floor as construction is going, uh, we will have a STEM lab that has been donated by the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation, and we are extraordinarily excited about that. Uh, in addition, uh, they are donating one for the Truett Street Community Center uh, that the Boys and Girls Club will manage that program. So that's two STEM labs that we are getting from the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation uh, in our community centers. Um, and again, it's, it's an exciting job. It's a different view. And uh, uh, just the department heads didn't know that this is also a part of our evaluation. So uh, thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Muir. Um, in the short, a short period of time, you've accomplished a lot, and I really appreciate the direction you are taking the department. And no counsel, you cannot have him back. Um, next up, we'd love to bring to the stage Meg Caton, the director of our Human Resources Department. Good evening. I'm Meg Caton, the Director of Human Resources. I'm excited to share the remarkable achievement of our Human Resources Department over the past year. We've streamlined our recruitment, we've elevated our outreach efforts, and we have fostered employee development. The goal is not just to hire, but to attract and retain talent while ensuring our current team continues to evolve and thrive. Outreach has been a key focus in expanding our talent pool. The team has actively engaged in partnerships with educational institutions, attended industry events, and utilized social media platforms to connect with potential candidates. Our HR team has been committed to reaching out to diverse populations to ensure our workforce reflects the rich tapestry of our society. We now offer English, Spanish, and Creole paper applications. Team members have actively engaged with, community, with the community at job fairs, school career fairs, and neighborhood walks. We also use several websites to advertise. The websites on the slide above are the only websites that are free of charge. However, we do have an extensive list of advertisement resources. We also created a public job opportunity text line where you can now receive text when new jobs are listed on our website. The HR team implemented innovative strategies and technologies to make the recruitment process more efficient. We embarked on a six month training program with our HR software system, which we will soon be done with. And that's a good thing. <laughs> This includes leveraging advanced applicant tracking systems, conducting targeted outreach, and refining our interview processes. It will allow easier tracking of documents, having all employee information in one place. Training is nearing completion, and we will slowly implement changes to our processes. We are retaining talent by providing exceptional onboarding programs, such as SBY CARES, this is a 30, 60, and 90 day new hire check-in system. SBY CARES stands for Culture, Acclimation, Readiness, Excellence, and Service. We want to ensure that we spot any challenges early on to support our employees through them. Additionally, it is an opportunity to celebrate what is going well. Once employees are feeling secure and confident within their position is when training and development becomes reoccurring. We are providing customized in-house trainings for all levels of staff while using local resources to ensure our staff are regularly trained. This past year, we had 40 employees who have been trained on seven core leadership behaviors, 131 employees were trained in CPR, and directors and assistant directors have become certified in mental health first aid. 
Not only does our recruitment, outreach, and development efforts place positive impacts on our employees, but it exists to better serve our citizens. We will continue to be innovative and work towards ensuring our human resources efforts continue to elevate. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Um, I've been with the city for six and a half years, and I've not seen a stronger HR department here at the city. The things that we are doing this past year and continue to do underneath Meg's leadership and the team that she has is phenomenal. I think we are top-notch in recruitment, and uh, we are the best place for people to work in the city of Salisbury with all that we have to offer, so thank you again. Next up, I'd like to bring Mike Dryden to the stage. He is our Director of Field Operations. Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, as Andy said, I'm the Director of Field Operations. I have had the privilege of being in the position for 10 months, so um, a little more than a year. <laughs> um, and within that time, we've, uh, we've accomplished quite a bit in the department. Um, field Ops is a very busy department uh, every day. We're constantly moving. We, are, um, we uh, oversee and maintain most of the infrastructure in the city, our, our roads, parks, uh, lights, all that. Anything you can think of, I feel like some days we take care of. Um, a few of the projects that we've done um, in those few months, um, I think it's the next, is it the next? yeah, there we are. Ant Street uh, Stormwater, we were part of that project. Uh, we've also been part of many projects at the zoo. Um, this is a good story. One of our staff members uh, helped with um, the, uh, the buffalo, the bison at the zoo was, uh, I think he was getting a manicure. And so we, he had to get sedated, so we helped him get back up on his feet, and that's one of our staff there helping with the uh, sedated bison. <laughs> um, a lot of other things that we do too for the city, we help out with a lot of the events with um, other departments, with ABCD, with Third Fridays, we staff that, as, and, um, and help out as much as we can with that, Maryland Folk Festival, um, a lot of the city parades were part of as well. So we. We collaborate very well with a lot of the other departments, um, which um, it, it you know comes back. They help us as well, so it works out both ways. <laughs> um, we've also added um, a, a mini sweeper to our our fleet division, um, which, if you look closely, that's me because I have to try these things out before the staff does. Because I want to make sure they're safe, and and I will let you know that thing will turn on a dime. Um, we'll be using that in the smaller areas that we're not able to use our larger sweepers. So if you see that downtown on uh, College or Waverly, give it a honk. It might be me in it. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. So um, with our Parks Department, when I came on board, our Parks Department was kind of, um, it was lacking with a lot of staff. Um, I have a conservation background. I, I, everything I think about, I think green. I, that's, that's who I am. I've been in the conservation world um, my entire professional career, and, I, and coming into the city, I'm coming in with that same mindset. So since being on board, we fully staffed our parks department. Um, they've taken multiple trainings. We've partnered with NGOs. All this has been a free service to my department with tree plantings. We've worked with DID, with their sustainable coordinator to help out with that, um, which has been great. Uh, we've planted I can't even think, Dylan, you could probably tell me, but we've planted quite a bit of trees through the city parks. And again, it's with collaborations with uh, NGOs that we've, we've built these partnerships with. Um, the trainings that the staff has, we've, um, our parks department is trained on stormwater BMP, so all the stormwater projects that you see up and down Main Street, they, know, they now know how to maintain those properly, which is money that we are now able to save in my budget, in the city budget, because now that we have we've built capacity by educating my team. Um, invasive trainings. Now, prior to me coming on board, it wasn't something that was thought about. When we maintain some of our city parks, we have invasives such as Phragmites and other things of that sort. These, these guys now are taking a look at their equipment before they go on to another park to, to mow so we're not spreading these invasives throughout all of our city parks. So we're, we're thinking about things differently now as we maintain the city, and that's, and that's, how we're, that's the direction we're hitting with field ops. Um, since April, we've been fully staffed. That's over 50 people in, our, in my department. I will say, we, we, 
just currently had an opening, but I will hire that. That position will be filled next week so I can regain my bragging rights of being fully staffed again next week. So that's, that, I, to me, I think that's an accomplishment because it's a, it's, it's a big department. It's a lot of moving parts to it. And our morale is up. Um, I call it the field ops family because that's who we are. We work together as a family, and it's, and it's shown a lot of success. Um, you know, and, and, and I want to end. Um, everything that, we, there's so much more I can sit here and talk to you guys about. But without my staff, it is, we can't do any of this. Those are the people every day that go out and they're on their mowers, they're, they're putting hot patches, they're doing the work. Without them, this isn't possible. And, you know, I appreciate everything they do, and it's daily that the, I am impressed by how amazing each one of those folks are that are on my staff. So I appreciate them. And if you're, any of you are in here, thank you very much. And with that, thank you. Just reinforcing what Mike said about being fully staffed, since I've been here, this is the first time that field operations has been fully staffed. And I need to give credit to Mike. His leadership style and his personality um, is infectious, and I think people really appreciate working for him. And I can't be remiss without saying, you know, we have been struggling in the last few weeks within our sanitation department due to some, some failing equipment. But Mike, along with the rest of his leadership team, were out there slinging trash alongside their staff. And other people have picked up different shifts to help make sure the trucks run on time and people are providing that service. So, Mike, I want to applaud you and your team for, for making sure we continue to service even in times of, of hardship. So, thank you. Next up, we have our Director of Infrastructure and Development, Rick Baldwin. Uh, good evening, as Andy said, my name is Rick Baldwin, Director of Infrastructure and Development. We are not fully staffed. <laughs> we desperately need engineers, Jack. There's always an opening. So while we're infrastructure and development, I'm going to start with development rather than infrastructure. In 2021, a shortage of available housing was identified as an issue for the city of Salisbury as well as nationally. To address this issue, the city administration moved to incentivize development. You can see some of the numbers up there behind me. As a result, in this calendar year, 184 new occupancy permits, new families living in the city of Salisbury, but you can see that that's a start. There's currently 160, 1,064 units uh, under construction, 990 additional approved for construction, and 3,095 currently in review. 5,333 houses is, is uh, quite a number. And if we take the value that uh, each of the developers had provided and average it out, that's $462 million of construction in the city of Salisbury uh, following these incentives. To ensure compliance uh, with a variety of areas, city planning and zoning code, stormwater regulations, floodplain management, critical areas, city construction standards, international building code for both construction of the buildings and the plumbing. Uh, these are some of the things that our department covers. In the past year, this represents over 100 reviews by engineering and planning and zoning, 900 field days spent by our construction inspectors staff, and over 1,300 permits and reviews and 2,800 inspections by our building permits and inspection team made up of three people. These folks work very hard every day to make sure that each new resident is in a safe and compliant dwelling, and the infrastructure that's added to our city that Mike has to maintain uh, is up to the city standards for the quality that you all expect. That's on the development side. On the infrastructure side, we currently have 12 projects in construction uh, or slated to start. We have two that are in bidding and two ready to go down to procurement. Seven in design, eight in planning, and one on hold, which Andy, we really want to get back to. The pictures also show uh, Unity Square, 
still under construction. I believe some of the other ones that may be up there or up there now show the raw water main. If you had been on Naylor Mill Road uh, carrying the city's water, we've been quite concerned about that for nearly a year. Uh, the water for that pipe is now traveling through uh, new infrastructure, and in the coming days you'll see that pipe removed from the road, and we are relieved to have that done. In addition to the things I've talked about already, uh, infrastructure and development handles annexations, zoning code, we apply for grants as many other departments do, but in this past year just two grants alone totaled $14 million, $12 million to improve the safety of our streets and advance Vision Zero, which Mayor Heath had mentioned, and $2 million to complete conversion of an old industrial site uh, on the North Prong to become a green space that will ultimately be part of North Prong Park. DID is a daily challenge, always interesting, but I must tell you, I feel fortunate to work with a great team dedicated to the best interests of the city. Andy? Rick, I just don't know how your team does it. Um, being short staffed for this past year and still accomplishing all those great things, you know, you guys should be proud of the efforts. Um, help is on the way. We are working through that, so I hope to have more staff on your team soon. Next to the stage, I'd like to bring our Director of Information Services, Bill Garrett. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the exciting world of municipal IT. Um, so my division, or my, my department has three divisions. We've got our GIS, which are all the maps and the, uh, the data analytics. And we've got the IT, which is everything that plugs in, turns on, bleeps, bloops, and lights up. Um, start with the GIS side. I'm um, going to focus on two of our main projects that we've accomplished this year. Um, first one is our drone program. Uh, we've got a fledgling drone program in the city that we administer from my department. Um, with that, we're facilitating training for other staff members to be able to become FAA certified to fly the drones. Um, one of the recent projects we've done is a uh, mapping of our zoo. Uh, with that um, accurate web mapping, um, with mapping, we're able to have a web application where you can go in on the website, you can, uh, you can check out information about the animals, fun facts about them. Um, that information is also good because we can send that out to different vendors, different partners, uh, if they're going to be doing any kind of designing of new exhibits or um, you know, rehabbing existing exhibits. It's, it's good data that we can send them. Um, next slide. Another application that we're, we've done is the uh, HCDD division or HCDD department's um, intake for the homeless um, staff that they, 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 they work with, the staff works with. Um, we've developed a digitized intake system that uses weighted intake values to classify and categorize um, the people that are being brought into the Ann Street Village um, project over there. Um, that allows the, the HCDD employees to have a dashboard that provides them with information such as demographic statistics, uh, services that are currently being provided, um, the general overall well-being of the of the personnel in the housing units. Um, it's just it's it's something that, that we're proud of. It's something that we think Mira's team is going to get some some good use out of uh, once his new staff is fully trained in it. Uh, which unfortunately, the person doing our training is out of maternity leave, so when she comes back, she can do all that training. So it's a hurry up and wait situation. Um, on our IT side of the house, um, we focused on efficiency and productivity over the last year. Um, start with the, in the public safety sector. Uh, we recently upgraded the network and server infrastructure at our police department uh, to allow a bandwidth capacity increase of about 300%. Um, that doesn't sound like it's that important or that, that, that critical, but as technology scales in the future, it's gonna allow us to implement a lot more features, functionality, and systems without having to worry about hitting any kind of a bottleneck or threshold you know, capacity limit. Uh, network upgrades, we recently brought multiple different facilities around the city into a, um, it's called a dark fiber network. It's a, it's a private fiber optic network that, that we use to connect the facilities. Um, this allows much higher speeds, much more uh, resource capacity for the various buildings in the city uh, footprint. Public access. Um, 
we worked with zoo leadership uh, to put in a live webcam at the uh, at the bear exhibit. Uh, this is plumbed through to the zoo's website, so globally anybody can log in and check out what the bear's doing. Uh, sometimes the bear is off camera. We try to fix that by having the camera aimed, but the bear is a wily bear and he gets you know goes where he wants to. Um, we have had a computer replacement program in the city for a few years now. Um, typically when a machine hits a certain age, our policy was to replace it to, uh, to get rid of the old, the, old, um, the old hardware, the old systems before they started getting really problematic, causing problems with sunset hardware, sunset equipment that, that would cost us, it would be cost prohibitive to, to keep. Uh, we revamped that, this current FY23, to allow us to move it as a capital project uh, to take some of the strain off of the departments um, uh, for their operating exp expenses and kind of allow us to smooth that over to get a better, more predictable budgeting approach to computer replacements. Computer inventory. Um, until this year, every department maintained their own inventory of computers, hardware, software. It's something we've been kind of um, trying to move into a central consolidated location for years. That finally happened this year, so now we maintain and manage everything. Um, it allows us to better uh, keep track of problem hardware, problem systems, uh, keep track of um, who's got what equipment and move things around as needed to provide more efficient and uh, high, generate hopefully higher productivity from staff. Um, finally, the headquarters building, uh, we went in and uh, implemented, developed and implemented the security, the network and server infrastructure projects in order to bring the new HQ building downtown online. Um, it in included uh, coordinating between internal and external partners in order to get everything done. Um, as others have said, um, could not do it without my team. Uh, we've got, we're a team of 10. We are just, I, I owe everything to these, these guys and girls. They are, they're amazing. So um, thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, Bill followed by Keith are the, the longest tenured directors, department heads that we've had with the city of Salisbury, both being here before I started with the city. I still not sure what Bill talks about most of the days. Um, but uh, no, but all joking aside, keeping the city safe with our cybersecurity, mapping our assets and our resources is fabulous. Your team does an amazing job. Um, next to the stage, I'd like to bring our director of finance who would rather be working on the audit right now, Keith Cordry. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> First, I would like to share uh, several accomplishments this year. Uh, finance is part of the city team that prepares the annual budget book, which has received the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Award for the fi last five years in a row. The reason that we uh, strive for this award is we get judged on whether we are following best practices for presentation and transparency. Keeping up with the best practices ensures that we are giving our, stakeholder, <coughs> our stakeholders complete and reliable information that they can understand. Uh, next, I'm pleased to report that the city has had no new audit findings over the last five years, and none are outstanding. Uh, clean audits matter. Stakeholders can trust the accuracy of information provided. Bond raters award better ratings, and interest costs are minimized. <clears throat> uh, the city has a strong grant team. Their efforts have brought results. Grant revenues have doubled since fiscal year 18. And few, a few uh, recent grant awards are bringing in 23 million. That's 23 million for the benefit of our citizens that is not paid for out of their pockets. Now a few uh, financial highlights. Make sure that's up there. Yep. On this slide, we have the total uh, general fund expenditures by year for the last 10 years represented on the top red line. As you might expect, uh, they are rising. 
Beneath that, you can see a purple line representing property taxes. Note that the red line, or that the total expenditures, is rising faster than the property taxes. So property tax revenues have not grown proportionately with expenditures, requiring that the city find other sources of revenue. Uh, the bottom chart there tracks the percentage of expenditures funded by property taxes, and as you can see, it has been raging, uh, ranging between 43 to 48%, but overall, it is trending down. Next slide. Uh, this slide uh, shows the dollar amount of expenditures funded by revenues other than property taxes has been growing, partly due to the overall budget growing, but also due to the decline in the proportion of expenditures funded by property taxes, as we saw in the prior slide. And now for my final slide, and the most important. Often citizens ask, does the city maintain sufficient reserves? Now, one measure to track our reserves is unassigned fund balance, which represents the spendable portion of the city assets that are not committed or assigned. The city has established a target to maintain an unassigned fund balance equal to four months of expenditures. This is represented by the green dotted line at the top. The red line at the bottom represents the minimum of two months of expenditures. The black line, the black dotted line, tracks the city's unassigned fund balance from fiscal year 2010 through 2023. As you can see from the chart, unassigned fund balance peaked in FY12 when it approached the four-month target. And then it fell to the two-month minimum line in FY17. But since FY17, it has been rising. And in FY23, we have again reached the four-month target, or approximately 4.8 million. Thank you. In this past election cycle, many people questioned our fiscal responsibility and our ability to manage our budgets effectively. As you can see, we are doing exactly that. We have a team of professionals, a team of people who are dedicated to the financial stewardship of the city through clean audits, best practices, and data collection. So Keith, thank you for you and your team's efforts. Next up, I'd like to bring to the table newly appointed Assistant Chief Howie Jewer, representing the police department. Good evening. Salisbury Police Department is a full service police agency that provides uh, crisis services as well as investigative services to the citizens of Salisbury. Uh, we're comprised of approximately uh, 85 officers currently uh, and supported with a staff of approximately 23 civilians uh, to make these accomplishments. Recruitment's been a challenge in the law enforcement industry for over the last few years. To overcome these hurdles, Salisbury Police Department's hired a media specialist to assist in rebranding our image and updating our social media pages, as well as, our, uh, as, well as improving our uh, web pages. Uh, as a result of this and us uh, presenting a more positive uh, outlook on our social media outlets, uh, we've been able to hire uh, eight additional recruit officers that will be going through the academy starting in January. Uh, this uh, represents an 8.5 increase of our offered strength. Uh, we're hopeful to continue uh, these types of uh, th these types of rec recruitment trends uh, moving forward in the coming years, so we can we can get back up to the full staff. Salisbury Police, uh, the Salisbury uh, City of Salisbury appointed the SPD's new. Uh, chief, uh, which was actually internally this year. This is the first time that this has happened in uh, 40 years. Uh, as a result of that, we've been able to obtain uh, 15 uh, promotions and leadership positions to include one assistant chief, four, uh, two captains, four lieutenants, four sergeants, four corporals, and somewhere there's a partridge in a pear tree there. 
This is an opportunity to improve morale uh, among the uh, rank and file at the Salisbury Police Department. Uh, new to the staff at the Salisbury Police Department this year is the PROTECT position, which is the public resource organizi organizing to end crime together. This is a grant-funded position that's provided through the state. Uh, their goal is to ensure utilization of all existing crime prevention programs and grants, coordinate community and youth programs, assist with community mobilization and activities to reclaim public space, uh, assist with rapid response to public nuisances, and coordinate community engagement with the local law enforcement agencies with jurisdiction in high crime uh, areas. The PROTECT uh, program helps to maximize state, local, and community uh, resources to improve communities, support a wide range of strategies to reduce crime and fear in the neighborhoods, and ensure the local law enforcement is employed in direct public uh, safety roles. Uh, finally, uh, since January of uh, 1st of 2023, uh, the police officers, your police officers for the city of Salisbury, have uh, encountered situations leading to the removal of 87 guns off of our uh, city streets. Uh, the bulk of these weapons uh, are not even registered uh, in any states. In 2023, SPD conducted a pilot program to assess community needs and potential benefits of implementing a mental health uh, response model program. Uh, during this time, we partnered with uh, Mobile Crisis uh, Sante affiliate uh, for several months to obtain data. Uh, we are now moving into the second phase of this, which is uh, employing a co-responder victim response uh, civilian that will work with our law enforcement officers to provide comprehensive uh, support uh, involving mental health, other social, uh, uh, social services uh, issues as well as addictions, and then getting them to the proper resources. Uh, based on the success of the program, SPD, SPD has applied for and received nearly $250,000 total grant funding to support hiring this full-time provider. SPD has been active in identifying, being awarded, and managing federal and state grants. These grants help to offset the unfunded projects, which include, once again, the mental health or co-responder uh, uh, individual, law recruitment and retention, law enforcement recruitment and retention, uh, Maryland criminal intelligence network strategies, warrant reduction, and state aid of police protection, all totaling $3,141,990. SPD Community Affairs continues to be very proactive in participating in, uh, in a effects such as National Night Out, uh, which averaged uh, 2,000 attendees, 75 vendors, and we issued, or we uh, were able to get approximately 200 bikes and school bags out to our community's youth. Uh, members of the Salisbury Police Department and uh, the Salisbury Explorers Post teamed up with Chesapeake Housing Mission to build ramps in the Salisbury area for individuals that struggle with mobility. And finally, promoting Maryland Special Olympics through events such as the Polar Bear Plunge and Torch Run, and collaborating with other stakeholders and leaders in our community, uh, we were able to sponsor the first Wicomico Night Out Against Crime. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. As, as he alluded to, we were able to hire internally our next chief of police, Dave Meinstein, who cannot be here this evening. But through a nationwide search, we decided to go internal. We had the support of our community who served on the search committee and an internal staff who knew we had what we needed internally. And through that, we've had cascades of appointments, and we are really fortunate to have strong leaders emerging within that team who are going to take us into the next several years um, of fighting crime and protecting our community. So thank you all. Next up, Acting Fire Chief Darren Scott of the Salisbury Fire Department. Good evening, everyone. Like every other city department, the fire department continues to see a tremendous growth and has been very busy over the last year. Some of our highlights include 
implementing of a cancer reduction program. Firefighting is a dangerous profession and career, and, excuse me, and cancer is the leading cause of death among firefighters. We have a 9% higher, higher risk of being diagnosed with cancer and a 14% higher risk of dying from cancer from most occupations. So beginning this past month, the department has initiated a new cancer reduction and screening process for all department members. This new cancer screening process is a simple blood draw that will test for 29 different cancers types, including lung, kidney, colon, ovarian, pancreatic, bladder, breast, and thyroid. Additionally, the department will implement implementing policy procedures changes and has placed new equipment in service that will reduce our exposure to carcinogens. The department has recently purchased ballistic vests with the comp composite plates for our personnel to wear when working on violent or potential violent scenes. Thanks to the significant donation received from the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore, we were able to purchase these vests, which will ensure that our personnel have the highest level of protection from firearms. Our far Fireboat One house at the City Marina recently received some much needed electronic upgrades. The state of the art upgrades will allow for safe navigation at a night and an improved search and rescue recovery efforts. This vessel responds throughout the region to assist with any water related emergency. Fire Prevention Month was just this past October. Lieutenant Zach Bridges led our Fire Prevention Task Force and along with the crews on duty were able to visit our 20 school, over 20 schools and daycares and provide our fire safety message to over 700 children and adults. Additionally, we provided fire engine displays and talks at Wacomico Night Out, Pinehurst and Glen Avenue Schools, Trunk or Treat events, and many, many more. Along with our fire prevention education is our fire marshal's office. They are expanding their role to include after fire investigations. The Maryland State Fire Marshal will still handle all criminal investigations. Our purpose and intent for conducting investigations is to determine the cause of the fire and then be able to adjust our codes, fire prevention strategies, and risk reduction practices accordingly. Training happens every day in the SFD. Our EMS clinicians are required to recertify every two to three years based on their specific level of certification. The SFD provides these training opportunities annually in-house, which saves on travel, time, and cost. Additionally, you may see our crews training at various locations throughout our fire district. Our crews will be completing training at the Hotel Esther prior to its demolition and will continue training at the buildings owned by the Salisbury University on Dogwood Drive. Training and requires structures is a tremendous benefit to our firefighters as it allows them access to real world buildings and scenarios rather than a training prop or building built and trained in over and over repeatedly. The department has placed an order for a new Pierce rescue truck which should arrive in early 2026. This new, re this new vehicle will replace a unit that is currently 22 years old and has reached its end of life for the use for the city. The department is excited to have our own dedicated associate medical director, Dr. Jenna Gerald, will provide training, direct phys physician access, protocol oversight, and will oversee quality control for our field conditions. Dr. Gerald will provide these services under the direction of Dr. William Todd, longstanding Wacomico County medical director. Having our own medical director will allow our top-notch EMS clinicians to receive direct feedback on their treatments and protocols and ensure that we are providing the very best care for over 12,000 EMS response we make annually. In October, the department voluntarily participated in the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Service System Ambulance Inspection Program. This program ensures that a department's ambulances are provided properly equipped, stocked, and inventory to provide the highest level of care possible. I'm proud to say that we passed the inspection and we have programs and policies in place to routinely ensure that we meet this standard. The department is con completing an LED lighting upgrade program at station 16. This upgrade, this upgrade will ensure that all three fire stations are being as environmentally friendly and financially prudent as possible. These lights are more efficient and will last significantly longer than the old fluorescent style lighting that was installed when the station was built. Our SWIFT MDCH, NCCNMIH team continues to shine locally, statewide, and on a national level. Recently, the team was awarded the Maryland Royal Hospital Association Royal Health Program of the Year at the annual conference in Ocean City. 
Additionally, the team just received notice that their resource abstract was chosen to be presented at the Mobile Integrated Health and Community Paramedicine Clinical and Leadership Summit in March of 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee. Finally, we are pleased to announce that along with Title Health, we received a grant that will allow us to partner one of our paramedics with a nurse practitioner from the hospital, Monday through Friday from 8 to 4, to provide minor definitive care to those people in our community who do not need to visit the emergency room or may lack access to quality health care. This program is beneficial to us because it allows for our ambulance to handle higher priority calls and it benefits the ER for freeing up beds. The program and activities that I have just talked about are just a brief glimpse into what your fire department is doing every day in the community to make sure the residents and visitors are well protected and have an improved quality of life. Thank you. I can't say it enough times, whether it's the cloud of smoke in your house or the car in the ditch or the pain in your chest, our team shows up on time, professional, well-trained, that is important to the city of Salisbury and the surrounding areas. And I can't say enough about the leadership you have at the fire department. John, thank you for joining our team and leaving that department in good hands with Darren and the rest of the team. So thank you again for all of your efforts in protecting the city and the surrounding areas. Our final department of the evening is our Director of Arts, Business, and Culture Department, Alan Swiger. Looking dapper. All right, we're almost done, guys. So um, I was told to stick to a script because I'm really going on tangents, and I'm going to do one right now. Um, I, was, I was listening to everybody's speeches here today, and it, it kind of occurred to me, this, this department is a year and a half old now. And in, all of the, uh, in many of your slides, I saw ABCD mentioned. And, and I just truly want to thank each of my de, you know, fellow department heads, administration, for helping us grow. I know there's a big learning curve with us and we're very honored to work with you. So we wouldn't be the team that we are today without everybody here. So thank you all. So. Um, I'm also honored to speak here today uh, and celebrate a few of the, comp of the many accomplishments our team has achieved this year. ABCD is comprised of a diverse team of individuals from many, many different professional backgrounds. From our museum cur curator at Poplar Hill Mansion to our zookeepers and event planners, we all work diligently every day to achieve our mission, which is to improve the quality of life for the citizens of Salisbury while driving economic growth and creating lasting memories. No landmark exemplifies our mission better than the Salisbury Zoo. This year, our zoo's education department inspired over 10,000 people to gain an appreciation for wildlife and conservation of our natural world. Nearly half of those folks participated in our Zoo to You program that features off-site animal presentations and educational activities conducted by our wonderful volunteer docents. In addition, the education department had a record-setting year in fundraising. Most substantially, $20,000 was raised from the two not-so-scary Halloween happening events. All of those proceeds go back into supporting our youth education programs. And if you've been to the zoo lately, uh, you may have noticed some exciting projects taking place. So as we strive on the back end to regain our AZA accreditation, you'll get the benefit of experiencing the zoo in a whole new light. Our expanded Eagle exhibit is nearing completion. A new admin trailer has been completed. Our ocelot shop was entirely refreshed. And most importantly, we are in the design phase for a brand new 15,000 square foot Andean bear exhibit, which when finished will make Salisbury Zoo the top state of the art breeding facility, not only in the region, but in the entire nation. So, and of course, we can't talk zoo without acknowledging the tireless work of our keepers, grounds crew, vet team, and our management team. No one is more committed to the care of our animals and our facilities than this crew. So thank you to all Salisbury Zoo staff, members of our zoo commission, and volunteers. Um, in early September, our citizens had concerns, we listened, and we responded. ABCD launched the Downtown Ambassador Program with the intent to make downtown Salisbury cleaner, 
safer, and enjoyable destination. Our ambassadors monitor the parking areas, provide hospitality escorts, and assist anyone with any questions they may have. They also check in with businesses, pick up trash, and sanitize areas as needed. So you may have seen these wonderful smiling faces uh, cruising around town in our branded golf cart with their light blue vests. Um, so if any of my ambassadors are here, I think I see you. Can you please stand up for a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, one of the biggest achievements of our department was the Maryland Folk Festival. So after five years of hosting the National Folk Festival, ABCD produced and managed the inaugural Maryland Folk Festival. This free festival featured hundreds of Maryland musicians, dancers, storytellers, and craftspeople with performers of four stages in the heart of downtown Salisbury. Despite Tropical Storm Ophelia raining on our party, we still had over 15,000 attendees on just Friday and Sunday, with Saturday being canceled due to safety concerns. According to a study conducted by the Salisbury University Beacon Program, this year's festival still generated over $500,000 in regional economic impact. And this amazing festival couldn't have happened without your support. Thank you to all of our donors. Thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors. Special shout out to the Maryland State Arts Council, Purdue Farms, Jim Henson Foundation, and Salisbury University. Congrats to ABCD's amazing event and marketing team for accomplishing this Herculean event. In closing, thank you for celebrating with me today, and I hope to see you all dancing in the streets in downtown Salisbury next September. Thank you. Having a recreation and parks background, it's really exciting to be able to hear and be part of the wonderful things that we are doing here in Salisbury. Culture, quality of life is very important to the fabric of what we do. Often it is pushed to the side, but knowing that is a center point of what we do with the city of Salisbury and what we fund to make sure people enjoy the time that they have outside of their work days, on their weekends and their evenings with their family and their kids. So Alan, thank you for what you do and what your team provides to the citizens of Salisbury and the surrounding communities. Now I just have a couple things I'd like to say for the next 30 minutes. <clears throat> Just kidding. It was March 16th, 2020, and the city scrambled to maintain continuity of service as we began an unprecedented journey through a COVID world. In order to succeed, we quickly realized that employee welfare needed to be the center of our focus. We go on to launch Thrive, a comprehensive series of employee wellness initiatives. This year, those efforts culminated with the successful adoption of the city's first labor code, safeguarding employee rights and benefits for the years ahead. Our people are our most valuable and vital asset. It was June 30th, 2021, and the city council boldly adopted groundbreaking legislation incentivizing large-scale redevelopment in downtown Salisbury. Horizon became the necessary springboard for several projects valued at more than $200 million this year, the Ross opened its doors, becoming the first successful new development project in downtown in a generation. It has reshaped our skyline and laid the foundation for future growth in our core. We knew then and advocate now for a reimagined downtown, one vibrant with housing and expanding commerce. Salisbury's future is bright and the continued revitalization of downtown remains a priority. It was December 6, 2022, and Julie Giordano began her tenure as county executive. Having experienced a rocky relationship with the county over the years, I was unsure of the times ahead. However, over the past several months, the city and county have proven critics wrong. Through collaboration and commitments to serve our citizens, we have brought people's health and safety to the forefront. Adopting a water and sewer extension policy, as well as inking a fair fire service agreement highlights the efforts of both administrations. Our recent cooperation is encouraging as we tackle new challenges. And finally, it was March 13, 2023, and I was given the honor and privilege to start serving as the city administrator. Though very familiar with the daily operations of the executive office, I found myself strangely unfamiliar with what was to come. 
the navigation of a complicated budget, the onboarding of a new mayor, and the unfolding of a complex election cycle. Some people said, Andy, you have shouldered a lot these past months. I don't know how you do it. That's simple. I didn't. We did. It was the team surrounding me who lifted me up and carried us forward. It was Jesse Turner and Donna Haig, the department leaders, and many others. Without them and their steadfast leadership and support, our achievements would be far less. So thank you and your teams for all that you have accomplished over the past years. Now please welcome Mayor Heath back to the podium one last time for the final word. Well, I, I, this is off script, so Alan, I'm, I'm going to take mine. Um, well, when uh, Andy walked up to me, I can remember, and he said, you know, you gotta start working on the state of the city. And I'm going, oh, yeah. And as a new kid on the block, I, I said, uh, I thought about it, and I said, Let, I'll talk about it with you tomorrow. And I came in the next day, and uh, I said to Andy, come on in here for a minute. I said, you know what I wanna do? I wanna let the directors take the majority of the program. And he gave me one of these. That's a look for anybody that can't see from the back. And uh, I had no concerns. And tonight, everyone, all of you, I couldn't be prouder, especially you, Corey. And the best part is I can put the smelling salts back into the container. <laughs> Seriously. Um, Thank you, Andy. I want to thank the directors for their presentations on behalf of their team. And isn't it interesting that each of them, the first thing they talked about was their team. We're successful not because of one individual, but out of all of us together, working together. And I'll be honest, I'm going to miss that. I also want to thank PAC-14 and Chris Damone for recording this event. Lastly, I want to thank everyone for the support I have received over the last nine years. In my role as city council president and acting mayor, I love this city and hope that I have the, had a positive impact on it. God bless you all. And God bless the city of Salisbury. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening.